guest today is Donna Goldberg. Donna was born and raised in a fundamentalist polygamous cult. Today she has the courage to step forward, speak out, and tell us what that was really like. Hello Donna. Hi, how are you today? I was raised in a Mormon fundamentalist polygamist cult in Mexico. I am the fourth of my father's 58 children and I'm also the first and the oldest, well I should say the oldest living of my mother's 14 children. My mother had 14 of my father's 58 children. That and greatly affected your reality growing up in an isolated area like that, didn't it? Well, definitely. It was interesting. I was When I was born, my father already had three wives living in the same house. Uh, one of them, which was his first wife, was my aunt. And um, so I knew no different. This is what it was like, you know, three wives in the same house, three mommies. And uh, I had a dad that, for the most part of my life, was not around much. So that left a lot of responsibility to the women who had the you know, responsibility of not only raising us, but also indoctrinating us into what they thought was the truth. And part of that truth was that we needed to uh, grow up and be polygamist. And I had over 10 men come to me at one time or another, starting at around the age of 14, uh, saying that, you know, they had been inspired or felt that I should become part of their uh, families. but. There was always something in me that just never fell for it. I, I guess being the oldest of my mother's children, I saw the suffering, the loneliness, all of her unmet needs, and I think that alone gave me a lot of strength. Tell us what your childhood was really like. What was the suffering like? How was it different than, say, the average child in America? Obviously, we were raised in poverty, compared to what people about here, you know, we, my dad would, would uh, bring home loads of hand-me-downs, so it wasn't like we could go to the store and experience new shoes, new, any, you know, new dresses, um, things like that. So we were always raised on hand-me-downs and ate very just simple. We didn't have a lot of meat in our um, diet. We occasionally had a chicken here or there that we actually had to go out and kill ourselves and clean. But it was, um, it was, I don't know, sometimes I wonder how much I really realized, you know, about the poverty. Because when you're in it, you, I started looking around, I guess I could say, at my, the outside people and seeing that even in their poverty, they still had their Sunday new dresses and they ate better than us. What about conveniences, running water? Well, actually, uh, conveniences and running water, up until I was 18, for all of my life, most of it, I would say 80% of my life, we lived without electricity, running water, plumbing. We drew water from a well. A lot of hard hardship was put on us because of that, because we would have to sometimes wash our clothes by hand on scrub boards. Um, my father did try to keep a May old Maytag around or a Maytag with an old washer ringer type thing. But with that many children, it was a burden every day. There was just loads and loads of laundry. It was a lot of responsibility put on me at a very, very young age. And that made me have to grow up. I felt at times that I was the mother and you know, didn't get to go out and play with my friends a lot or just play house or dolls. I was always dealing with real babies, real diapers, and it was a lot of responsibility that um, that was placed on my shoulders at a very, very young age. So I understand according to the religion that your mothers, all of your mothers, were expect to have children as often as possible. So there was literally a mass production of babies and am I to understand in a home that had no flushing toilet, no running water in the kitchen? That's correct. They were taught that they needed to have as many children as possible. I like to tell people the only uh, family planning we were ever taught was to plan on having a big family. And I remember just weeping, literally weeping, when probably the last four pregnancies my mother uh, told me about because not only was her she in very, very bad health, it meant more responsibility for me. I was born and then I had four brothers in a row. so. 
I was her right arm. Uh, everything fell on me and I just remember just thinking what kind of God would require this of a person to just keep giving birth after birth and uh, regardless of the health that she was in. It didn't matter that she had varicose veins. It didn't matter that, um, you know, they never ever thought about can we afford this child. It was just a requirement to populate this earth and the hereafter. I was taught my whole life that we were having children so that we could populate the next world and um, I don't know. It was distressing to me because it just meant more work for me and uh, of course today I adore all my siblings. You know my mom did end up having a total like I said of 14 and and it's made us all stronger, I believe, and hard-working citizens because we had nothing, therefore it, it made us strive to have. And um, Donna, isn't it true that you literally forfeited your education as a child to stay home and help raise those babies? That's true. When um, I um, graduated from sixth grade, and I remember that we went to get registered to go into high school, me and my other two sisters from my dad's first wife. We were all graduated, graduated at the same time and uh, my father got cold feet and decided that no, um, we needed to stay home and help our moms, especially me, that I needed to stay home and just help mom raise the kids. He, uh, he was also had the fear that uh, we lived in Mexico that we, if we went to the high schools that we might you know, start longing or falling in love with somebody and leave the believed our church and our beliefs. So it's interesting because yes I had to forfeit my education but I've always had a hunger for education. I've always been a reader when the first thing I did I'm gonna jump ahead but the first thing I did when I did leave um, our group at the young age of 18 is I went back and went to get my GED and I was so proud of that moment. I graduated in 1980 with a GED at the School for Adults in Stockton, California. And then I went on to take a, an entrepreneur course. It was like a three-month course. Um, and I've been involved in Toastmasters for over 10 years. I've been involved in several writing groups. And I am always, like I said, just hunger for um, knowledge and I read a lot. I always read in several books depending on what I'm in the mood for but I'm an avid reader and can't stress enough the importance of education so that we can make educated choices which I have just been you know going along learning probably at a slower pace because I've just had to just rely on the universe and God to to bring right people into my life and the right books or whatever, but I think it's that longing and that uh, hunger that I have had that has helped me to be where I'm at today and I've got a long way to go and you can never learn enough. I believe that you have become the dynamo that you really are because of the deprivation you face as a child. It actually pole vaulted you into a great hunger for knowledge and wisdom and you have achieved a lot of that Donna you're quite remarkable well thank you uh, thank you I you know, like I said I I love to um, be of help to people and my siblings I, I feel that me having had the strength to get out I left at the young age of 18 and um, struggled for years with a lot of fear and guilt because of what I had been taught and for years um, I felt like wow I'd question myself am I really gonna go to hell but then I would think back to all the requirements that were required of me and I would think of my beautiful mom and all of my dad's other wives and what they were going through and their unfulfillment and it would just make me think, nah, nah, if, I'm, if I have to live in hell to get to heaven, um, I don't even want that kind of heaven because I'd had enough kids in this lifetime. I don't, I don't need kids in the hour after. <laughs> I, I need some quiet time. It was like, you know, living in a big family, it was, like my mother used to say, it was like going to a birthday party, but you can never leave because the kids lived there. And it was just always noise and responsibility and chaos. And um, I, I don't know, I'm 56 years old and I've never, ever, ever lived in a home where I wasn't taking care of other people. I went from being my mother's right arm to 13 of my, um, or 12 of my siblings. 
to marrying a man who had three children, helped him raise those children. And um, then my mother and uh, stepfather ended up moving in with me for seven, eight years after I lost my husband to leukemia. And I've always been the nurturer, the taking, you know, taking care of people person. I keep thinking I need some time along, but it never, you know, it never happens. I find myself just welcoming someone back in, someone that needs help or uh, needs me. I, I do it from my heart, and uh, that's just who I am, I guess. Donna, I'd like you to tell us some stories about your childhood. Wow. Well, um, it was tough. We did move around a lot, but when I was born, we again, we were born onto cold cement floors. There wasn't heating, there wasn't electricity. I remember as a child having to go out and draw water, literally, with buckets, metal buckets from the well. Sometimes I think, wow, how did our parents even not worry that we were going to fall down and drown because some of those wells were open. Um, I remember moving from from Chihuahua up to a place in the mountains where we spent two years living amongst the natives and most of these people just lived on tortillas and beans and rice and lived literally on dirt floors and at one point in our life I remember when we moved up there we lived in a little three bedroom humble humble home one of the rooms had a wooden floor I'm talking just planked planks of wood, no shellac or anything on it, just wood. And the other one was a dirt floor that we would literally have to sprinkle down to be able to sweep it so there wouldn't be dust everywhere. And then the other one was a cold cement floor. But it was, um, like I said, no conveniences. We used a potty our whole life, a five gallon bucket when we, there became so many of us, we'd have to use that at night to go potty in and then we would have to dump it every day in an old outhouse. And we there were so many times in my life we didn't even have toilet paper. That was a luxury. I remember my mother taking old clothes that my father would bring from the States and after she would cut up the old clothes to make little pants and little shirts and little dresses for my siblings, she would use all of the um, remnants from the old coats and cut them up into small, small pieces and put them in it like a cardboard box out in the outhouse so that we would use that as tissue. It was, um, it, we really had to sacrifice and uh, looking back it's, it's, I guess it was just part of what had to be done and it makes me have a lot of empathy and um, gratefulness and thankfulness in my heart for what we do have today. People take for granted the luxuries that they live with. and. I always say, I hope I don't ever have to go back to that, but I can make a situation work, you know. I can go camping and, and, and it's, I, I live camping my whole life, so I don't even <laughs> enjoy going camping anymore, but I can, I can make it work. Give me a good hotel room. I'll make it over, <laughs> over camping any day. Because I do feel like that we camped out a lot. One of the girls had told me that often when there weren't any pieces of cloth that there was a reflection that rich folks were the ones that had a Sears Roebuck catalog in their outhouse. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We didn't even have magazines, but I do remember even, it's crazy, it's embarrassing to say, but I mean I remember my mom and people taking all of our old notepads from school or our um, tablets and once they were no not useful they would tear them up and you know use sheets of paper to wipe our butt so it was bad you know we would bathe the kids in metal tubs we'd have to literally heat buckets of water up on our stove and then just we would try to start with the cleanest kid in the house but by the end of the day living on dirt floors and in Mexico where there wasn't paved roads it was muddy dirty we had a lot of fleas growing up so oh it was you know, our sheets were covered with little blood stains all over from us getting eaten by fleas at night. We would wake up with flea bites all over the place. Um, I am. You said you'd start with the cleanest kid. Do you mean you bathed all the, the children in the same water? Yes, that's the fact. Uh, we would pretty much put six, eight kids through the same water, but we always kept a fresh bucket with a little, um, oh, what do you call it, um, vinegar, because we couldn't even afford um, conditioner, but that vinegar would, uh, my mom would just take a big cup of the warm uh, water after she'd sudsed everybody down and give them their final large cup of um, rinse 
and rinse their hair and rinse their little bodies off and then we would you know put them in a towel get them dressed put the next kid in the poor kid at the <laughs> end was pretty much in a mud bath but but he got rinsed off i have to say and felt clean and loved my mud in spite of the poverty i was very very blessed to have um a nurturing loving mother that it made up for a multitude of what we didn't have because the love was felt made me feel secure so we did have whether it was a, you know warm soup in our tummies or beans or bread and milk i never went hungry i just always longed for you know the good food the cold cuts or or different kinds of food that we you know mayonnaise was a luxury um it was just things that people take for granted. We never had canned food on a shelf. Everything that we had was either bottled in the old um, glass bottles. My mom would can tomato juice and whole tomatoes and peaches and anything that they could get a hold of during season and get for cheap, they would can. And then um, that's what we would open and use. But when we got moving around from place to place, that even became very scarce. The, the canning and the bottling pretty much stopped when I was in my teens. I mean, it just didn't happen as often. When you were growing up and all of those babies were born to so many different mothers, please tell me what childbirth was like as, it, as you were seeing as a child under those conditions of poverty. Well, my everybody pretty much depended on the, the, the great physician, the Lord, to take care of them. They didn't believe in going to hospitals. They felt that um, God was enough. I saw their concern going in to give birth in our homes. And as a child, I remember being on the outside of the door, on the other side of the door, and just hearing the agonizing whimpering and pain of trying to push out a baby and um, agonizing with no medication whatsoever. I remember watching my mom prepare for the birth by heating up water on the stove and just putting um, Lysol and disinfecting out, disinfectant out. And I also remember her taking like old string, like the string that they would save out of the flour sacks that we would buy our flour in. There was this string that if you just pulled it out, it would unravel. And she would save that and wash it and then she would uh, take several strands, two or three or four, I don't know, and um, braid it together and then disinfect that in alcohol or whatever. And that's what she would prepare and use to tie the cord of the baby when it was born. The first memory I remember of my mom was actually, like I said, I was the oldest of her kids and I had so far three brothers in a row. And she was pregnant with her her um, fifth child. No fourth yeah, you know, fourth child and she had promised me this was going to be a little girl I was desperate to have a little sister and so when the time came to her to give birth it was on a Sunday afternoon and I remember them calling one of our family friends to come my mother was in labor and help her deliver and me and my little friend stood outside underneath the window and could just hear my mother just you know agonizing and just calling out to God to help her give birth and on and on. Well, she gave birth all right and it wasn't a little girl. It was the fourth boy in a row. And I, I'll never forget, she called me in and was apologizing that she had led me to believe that it was going to be a little girl. And I was very upset with God at that point, or that she hadn't given birth to this little girl. But the next four were girls after them. So finally. Finally. So <laughs> there was a lot of years between me and my help because there's seven years between me and my sister. But I believe me, by the time I was six, seven, I was already helping my mom change diapers and doing dishes and were, you know, the responsibilities became larger. And uh, pretty much by the time I grew up and left home at 18, um, my sister was just, what, uh, seven years younger? She was 11. So she was finally at the point where I felt, okay, if I leave, at least my mom's got somebody now to help her with all of the responsibilities and hard work. But what happened with your brothers when they grew up? Where, did they start working as children as well? Yes, um, all of my brothers, <clears throat> by the time they were 15, 14, 15 years old, they were pulled out of school. Even today, many of them struggle to just sign their name and write. Um, they can't express themselves fully because they were yanked out of school at such young ages, but they were sent out and they worked in construction and drywall and 
other than just their bare necessities to survive and a little tiny bit of spending money, all of the money was sent back to my dad and uh, to help uh, put food in our mouths and to help support my dad's exploding family. There was always kids being born. Uh, on more than one occasion, my dad had, um, well, like we called uh, twins, triplets, quadruplets, but they were from different wives. For example, when I was born, I was born October 6th, and on October 30th, just 24 days later, my dad's first wife gave birth to my sister, Laura. So we were like his twins. We grew up, and, and then six months later, his third wife gave birth to my brother, Chad. So we were actually like triplets growing up together. And like I said, we all lived in the same house, so um, it was just part of life. And later on in life, the same thing. The wives had you know, babies so close together that there's just all kinds of connections there. I think it bonded the children closer to each other, too, because they grew up within their age groups and had to make do for, for you know, ways of um, entertaining themselves and playing and everything. So uh, they're pretty close. How many wives did your father ultimately have? Well, he ultimately had 10 wives and fathered 58 children with eight of those 10 wives. Two of the wives were older and widowed women who couldn't produce any more children, but they were assets to the family. One of them was a school teacher, and, and uh, I guess he's, he felt that they could be a, a help to the family. And uh, so ultimately there, there was 29 boys, 29 girls that my father fathered. And today there's um, over 300 grandchildren that my father has. We don't have a family tree, we have a family forest. And um, babies just are coming out and popping out faster than I can keep track of. Please Donna, tell us how you got out. What inspired you and how did you do it? When I became a teenager and I started having these men that were repulsive to me come and tell me that they wanted me as a, a wife and uh, I would look at the other wives that they already had and the circumstances they were living in and it didn't appeal to me at all. And I used to think, well, God himself is going to have to tell me if I am to marry one of these men because I had no interest in them. I actually had um, fallen in love with a, a local Mexican kid that was Catholic. He came from a large family of 11. And that was a big no-no, and I was constantly reminded that I was going to go to hell, and that this man was Catholic, and, and that he would never be able to exalt me, and that he was going to be a womanizer. They, they just seemed to prejudge everybody. You know, everybody was no good. If you weren't born under the priesthood and born into the Mormon um, religion, you were an, considered a Gentile, an when outsider. When you say Mormon religion, you, you're speaking My, specifically speak, about fundamentalist polygamous Mormons. Yes. Yes, because today's Mormons, as we know, don't practice polygamy, but I came from the old polygamy. Um, my grandfather actually went to prison and served three years in the state penitentiary in Utah because he was adamant about his beliefs and wasn't about to um, give up his beliefs. And my father was the same way. That's one of the reasons he went to Mexico was so that he would not be arrested and persecuted, and he felt he could... Um, live his religious and freedom down there. So all of us children, all of my father's children were actually born and raised in Mexico, uh, about four hours south of the El Paso border. We all speak Spanish fluently and I have a great love for Mexico and the Catholic people. But during this time of my you know, teenage years, my father married one of my best friends. She was just two years older. Um, than me exactly we were both October girls but when I turned 13 she turned 15 and my father married her like a week or so after her 15th birthday that was so weird to me and it was just put a whole new spin on my relationship with her but um, to this day I find a hard time uh, just trying to even comprehend how that was allowed a 15 year old especially now that I have children of my own and uh, looking at how young and I mean that to me was just it's like almost it was pedophilia when I think back about it you don't marry someone that's underage I feel that um, especially later within a just a few years after that a couple of years my dad married my second best best friend my BFF since I was six years old and she was 19 but 
I was very close to her and I had seen her go through or at least a couple of boyfriends that she was madly in love with and they were young and they didn't hold the priesthood like that she was told that my father did and she was very much coerced into marrying my father more out of guilt and sense of duty than any kind of love. She did end up having six children with my father. Today I'm still friends with her, I'm still friends with his first wife, the, the 15 year old. She went on to have five children before she got the strength to leave my father. But I was very disillusioned in the fact that the wives kept getting younger. There was never a limit to any amount of wives that they could get. With each wife came more poverty, less nights for my dear deprived mother who was already lonely and hurting and depressed and um, it just put a whole new spin. I just thought there was no limit. I mean if a woman was available and a woman showed interest in the man, we were taught that a woman, it gave a woman an opportunity to pick out the man of her dreams. Well, um, once the women just kept adding up, it was, um, I didn't want that life. I'm like, okay, I want a husband of my own. And uh, so that led to me, I guess, wanting to just get out and find my own husband. Well, Donna, isn't it typical in these cults that they marry real young girls so they can raise them the way they want to? Your father wasn't the only one marrying teenagers, was he? Yes, my, my father was by no way the only one. It was happening with pretty much everybody that had belonged in the religion, in the cult that I called it. Because my dad's brother actually started our cult. He was our prophet and we were taught that you didn't question the prophet. And I remember even believing when I was in his presence that I was actually protected from harm and evil because this was God's anointed man. And, and I felt like he was it. He was the closest thing to Jesus. In fact, we heard more about our prophets our whole life than I ever heard of the sweet name of Jesus. And um, it was always about being brainwashed into sacrifice, sacrifice. To, uh, heard over and over. Brigham Young had over X amount of wives, 40 something wives. And the more we suffered, the more blessing we were going to be rewarded with in the hereafter. And it just didn't make sense. Hello. I am Rebecca Kimball. You have been listening to the true life experiences of Donna Goldberg. The voice behind the camera is mine. Thank you for joining us. A message from SafeKidsNow.com The seed we sow in our children are not our words, but our behavior.